looking for you to try to step out to move a road or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, very good uh, uh, comments from uh, Frank this morning. And he, uh, he did me a favor in, in moving ahead because um, my name is John Love. I'm with NYSERDA. I'm a, man a project manager in the Smart Grid area. Uh, I co-manage the program with Mike Radinowski, who's also here. He's up in the back. Um, you know, we manage the Smart Grid program. And did us a favor by uh, pretty much laying out the, uh, the, the program for us. Um, we do uh, look forward to putting out another solicitation, um, and hopefully we, we can see some of the uh, superconductor activity uh, come in under that, uh, under that solicitation, things that come to mind um, for our program, our uh, energy storage uh, scenarios. Uh, we see in the um, superconducting cable, we see in the fault current like to see more of that activity coming in under our smart grid arm. Um, so just want to say good morning. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator of the next, uh, the first panel, which is going to be energy and power. Uh, I'd appreciate it if the, um, uh, the panel members would, uh, would come up and take a seat uh, while, I'm, while I'm talking, and uh, I'll introduce you and we'll, we'll get started. Um, first wanted to also say thanks for all who helped uh, pull, the, uh, pull the meeting together. Especially Emily Benke here at, uh, at College of Scale Science and Engineering uh, did a great job. Uh, Aaron Keenan from Superpower, Bill Wilson at Emtech Labs. Uh, we're also very fortunate to uh, be able to conduct our meetings here. Thanks to Chris Martino, who's not here, he had to step out. Um, but uh, certainly an excellent facility for, uh, for holding the conference. Um, Frank did a great job of describing some of NYSERDA's pro uh, programs and our involvement in the superconductivity area. He also mentioned challenges facing um, New York grid, the electric grid in New York, um, some of which were highlighted uh, by, the recent, uh, by the recent storms, and, and many of which can be um, addressed by superconductor solutions. So we're looking to all of you to put your, put your heads together uh, and, and look at some of the challenges that we face here in New York State and uh, see what kind of solutions we can, we can come up with. You mentioned the Albany superconducting cable project. And it reminded me of something I heard a while back. There's this uh, superconducting cable uh, walks into a bar, and uh, <laughs> before he can even get to the door, the bartender says, well, stop. We don't serve superconducting cables here. So the superconducting super cable, without blinking an eye, just turns and leaves without any resistance. <laughs> Doesn't argue his case at all. Just leaves no resistance. This panel is no joke. I'm, I'm very excited about this panel. They've got some great, uh, great applications um, uh, and, and showing how the technology is moving from research out into the uh, out into the field. Um, the only purpose that the joke did serve was to mention um, no resistance, and that's why many in the energy field are attracted to superconductors because of this ability to conduct electricity with zero resistance, no loss. Um, so if you do. You a lot of effort to generate our electricity, whether it's whether it's from renewables or fossil fuels, and um, uh, by the time it gets to the end user, there's less of it, and uh, there are some superconductor solutions to help us in that uh, in that area. Frank uh, did mention partnerships. Uh, Pradeep mentioned partnerships. Um, I think it's a great theme. I think this panel knows a, knows a little bit about partnerships. They really do get it. Uh, they've all created partnerships, some with each other, to move superconducting technology out of the lab onto the manufacturing floor and into field demonstrations. So to get things going, I'm going to do a quick introduction of the panelists. Uh, I believe in your uh, brochure you have their bios with all of their accomplishments, and they are an accomplished bunch. Um, so you can take a look at that at your leisure. Um, then after I introduce them, they'll have several minutes to discuss their activity in the superconducting area. And then after everyone has spoken, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions. And uh, I would appreciate it if you don't be shy, get your questions together, make sure you get your questions answered. These things go a lot better if there's audience participation and you get your questions out there. I can serve them up with some questions, but um, it's certainly better to uh, have the audience participation. All right, so uh, getting started, we have Mark Johnson with ARPA-E. 
Shang Li from Brookhaven National Lab, uh, Scott Nickerson with Applied Materials, Wolfgang Stoutman from GE Global Research, and Zach Wolf with Con Edison. So I appreciate it. Maybe we'll we'll go in order as uh, as it is in your uh, in your brochure. Mark Johnson, you're you're number one. So why don't you uh, why don't you take it away? Sorry, we didn't sit down in the right order. There. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Mark Johnson. Hello. Thank you very much for having me here. I, I really appreciate the invitation coming up to talk in New York with the uh, with the Institute for Cognitive Safety. I'm with RPE. I've been there a little bit over three years. RPE is the Advanced Research Project for the Institute for Energy. It's about a four-year-old agency, basically a department of energy, um, tasked with funding advanced research. And I keep saying that to every time I go to a meeting like this. Um, one of the questions people have is, you know, when they put in a proposal to RPE, why we didn't fund their transmission line demonstration or their um, basic research accelerometer or, or, or something like that. And we're an advanced research agency. So superconductivity actually falls right into our wheelhouse as far as where we do the reporting thing. Uh, but we didn't go into doing advanced research around this. We support superconductivity, and let me, uh, let me explain that a little bit. So I'm a program manager there, and I run a few programs at this point. A couple of programs, one's a grid-scale energy storage program, and the other one's a rare earth alternatives program. And uh, neither of those were targeted specifically at superconductivity. It's problem statement driven research. It's a, we have a problem with energy storage systems, and we start getting more and more renewables on the grid. How do we wind up balancing those renewables so we don't have intermittent heat of the power that's reflected by the generation, or the loss of inertia that we wind up having on the grid by having these variable resources out there that are what are called non-dispatchable resources. So what's neat about superconductivity that we wound up uh, taking advantage of this is in applying for that project with GE Superpower and Brookhaven and a number of other partners on that, led by ADU and other teams, we said, you know, superconductivity is just getting to a tipping point where it's not quite there yet, but if we solve a few key technical challenges, particularly in that one focused at issues around things that wind up getting into cost control of solar, you know, increasing the critical current, right, which is the regular unit of temperature that's designed by the system, and a given field designed by the magnet that winds up using. So you really want to maximize the amount of current you wind up running through the system while anticipating you know, any losses that you might get because there are times when you have losses that you need to either anticipate to avoid it or take steps to the system. So really laid out a applied research program around that. And that's what we wound up supporting. What's also neat about that specific project is that team has evolved over the last uh, couple of years. And it was initially uh, ABB was pushing it. Well, now at this point, Superpower and, and we work together with this with the US Army. And the Army has a new application for its vacant and has been used that as its first adoption. So we've started working together with the Army Research Lab to look at how we can wind up taking that from those research outcomes to build the next stage of research so we can ultimately wind up demonstrating the lights out there that will really have that impact on the grid. So, you know, that's a really good prototype of how an RP project works. You have scientific challenges you need to address, bringing together teams ranging from universities and national labs up through really system deployment kind of, kind of people. And they're all addressing that applied research problem together, building that partnership. And then also working to build some subsequent partners where we have a handoff that you know, success for us is not a continue to fund and fund and fund. Success for us is we take the starting technology at this point and move it to the next point. Um, that also got me looking at superconductivity and, and, and sort of the history of materials innovation team. And I know there's a number of people that have uh, been working in superconductivity for 25 years. I noticed one thing that was not mentioned on the history of superconductivity in, in New York was the, uh, the famous ACF meeting where the technician of superconductivity was actually uh, first announced. And that was in New York as well. So, but that was almost 25 years ago. What's neat looking at materials innovation throughout history, and I don't care if it's looking at the development of the Bessemer process, the development of the refining of silicon, the development of nylon, it takes 25 years from the first invention, demonstration on a bench scale laboratory technology for it to get up to practical commercial application. So you start seeing these applications moving forward. That's repeated time and time and time again through platform materials research technology. Very rarely do things get get through faster. I think about 1948, the first transistor was first used. Intel wasn't founded until the late 1960s. So it does take this long time to take this. It has a huge commitment of the community to wind up getting this. These are the 
you all should be commended for really pushing it forward. The neat thing that I was able to say, say is, hey, I can step in at this point, 25 years out, with a really hard, hard question to answer. Now we can wind up sort of changing how we want to think and think. So that's really the tipping point where I see the super stuff. Then we started a, the next program, which is the Rare Earth Alternatives Program. We started looking into rare earth magnets and say, well, what is the, what's the new super stuff that we ought to do with rare earth magnets? Things like rosies and iridium. Let's really get hard on some of the technical challenges so we can meet the tipping point. So as a result, we've, uh, we've supported the local community with uh, superpower. And I should say, uh, over two years, I guess, across the uh, Alaska River in Massachusetts there, and American Super does it as well. So we're working really closely on that. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, next, we have Stanley <coughs> from uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, thank you, Dr.
product development and solving um, high value problems. And that's really what we looked at. It started, this program started in Varian probably about six years ago where one of the, the principal investigator on this program, he actually went in front of that board and started pitching this idea about fault memories. Of course, they all looked at him and said, what are you talking about? Come back in a month, get some more information. And eventually after about three years, it was really brought up through the ranks through our extensive vetting process to say, is this something we should really be involved in? Um, there was a, an extensive you know, uh, research of, is there actually a problem out there? Is there a business case? But more importantly, we looked at it and said, can Varian, now applied, really you know, compete and produce in this market space? So here we are today. Um, you know, it really comes down to partnerships like we talked about earlier. You know, applied materials, big company, you know, big giant in the semiconductor space, but when you start getting out into the utility space, they say, you know, who's applied, they Google us, they don't have a clue who we are. So really it's about partnerships. You know, we're partnering on this program, we're partnering with you know, Superpower for their you know, world-class you know, superconducting tape. Um, we're doing the project with Central Hudson, installing it by the end of this calendar year in the Poughkeepsie, um, just one of the Poughkeepsie substations. You know, certainly supports Unite Serta, which has been great. You know, we certainly couldn't have done it with, without the partnerships we have. You know, consultants as well, you know, Patrick Duggan, who's here today, you know, formerly of Con Edison, you know, has given us a lot of insight. Because again, we're, we're you know, semiconductor guys. We're learning this space. We're trying to understand that you know, everyone in the, in the uh, utility space, they're all racing to be second. No one wants to be first. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's quite different from the uh, semiconductor space. And we're not going to change it. We're going to adjust to it. And again, you know, being competitive in that space is really important. Um, you know, why, you know, again, we're at you know, Applied Materials, we're out of Santa Clara, and our, our office is in Boston. You know, what are we doing here? Um, we have a, quite a presence in New York. You know, with, with our work here at Nanotech, you know, pretty decent presence with Applied Materials. Um, Varian, for the past five years, has done extensive college recruiting in New York. And we've hired a lot of people from Cornell, Clarkson, RPI, you know, for the high tech. Um, we have quite a uh, college recruiting process where we have what's called the fusion program. And we, we go through probably about 12 different universities, and each year we hire about 10 different students. So it's uh, pretty extensive. You know, a lot of people from Car Clarkson, Cornell, and like I mentioned, RPI have joined our team, and it's, it's really a you know, world class set of engineers that we have on our team. I mean, again, it, it really is about partnerships. We wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the, the group that we partnered with. Um, uh, I think that's, that's pretty much it. I think uh, really what we're trying to realize is, again, we're not superconductor companies per se. What we're trying to do is trying to bring it so that there is a product that really opens up the market, which will enable the need for a superconducting material and try to make it so that, you know, someone mentioned earlier, it's always five more years, five more years. We're trying to really make it so that it really is five years from now, where there really is a, a growing, you know, need for superconducting material for increase in technology and, and products that are really drawing that material out um, in the market. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Wolfgang Stoutner from EE Global Research. <coughs> yeah, um, I'm from Electromagnetization and Superconductivity Lab, and uh, the, our main objective is to support the uh, MRI business. We need to come up with new ideas for MRI systems, but we already get funding. And uh, last funding we got from DOE for a superconducting generator uh, we filled in in the 10 megawatt range. Uh, where we marry MRI technology with uh, superconducting generator technology based on uh, low circuit rate superconductors. And that was a very interesting task. Um, I myself worked in uh, that area since 1977 and have seen the development of superconducting technology. And it was really very exciting. <laughs> and uh, I see it every year again. Uh, we are at a tipping point right now Zach Wolf with Con Edison. Um, I work there as a project engineer in our uh, high voltage power division for substation transmission and a few generating uh, stations we have left. Con Edison is a utility provider of electric uh, gas and steam that's electric for all the five boroughs in Westchester County. Um, and I am the project engineer on a deployment uh, project where we're actually putting in an uh, inherently fault current switching superconducting cable um, on our grid. Um, we have a partnership with partnership with American Superconductor, um, the Department of Homeland Security, and NYSERDA, uh, as well as a few other companies that are um, supplying some of the refrigeration material and, and other services. But uh, we're, we're planning to deploy this uh, project uh, beginning uh, shovel and ground this year, moving into next year to uh, put the system online. It's a 15 kV class cable. 
um, that will be inherently cost sharing limited. Um, the partnership with uh, Department of Homeland Security is, uh, they, they've been focused as echoing a few things that were said earlier today on grid resiliency. They're looking at superconducting the cable as an ability to interconnect existing assets that may be perhaps weren't uh, capable of being interconnected before to get higher capacity off existing assets. Um, they, do, they can do this because of the high current carrying capability, high power carrier, uh, power carrying capability, but uh, more specifically, um, the fault current limiting capability we're looking at too. Um, they can do these in uh, continued as well in key load well in these high um, dense load populated areas that we have, especially in New York City, other places across the country too. We see a lot of the same um, issues with the utilities in the high uh, low density populations. Um, fault current limit, uh, fault current or growing, our equipment's not able to handle that and it's really capital intensive to replace uh, equipment that's overheating. Um, and so we're looking for solutions um, and ways that we can interconnect our systems um, and limiting by limiting fault current. So it's really not the dominant current for steady state generating and, and load supply, it's these fault currents that are um, overheating our equipment. So that's basically the impetus for us working on the project. Um, and, uh, and we're looking to, it's really a two phase project. It was a, at Oak Ridge National Lab, we tested the cable with American Superconductor. We proved out the capability, the fault current limiting capability. That was phase one. And now we're finally moving to phase two, where we're going to be um, testing the interoperability, constructability, and really kind of durability and maintenance of this. Uh, as again, echoing, I think what Scott said, kind of racing to be number two is the typical modus operandi for um, utilities. We don't want to be the first or risk adverse. We want to make sure the equipment is tried and true. Um, so it's good that we've had these partnerships um, in ways that we can feel comfortable deploying these systems in with the partnerships and people that are familiar with the technology and kind of kick the tires a little bit um, and, and see what these things are like before our system planners really put them in their portfolio of tools they can use as we plan our equipment here in the future. Great. Thanks. Round of applause for, uh, for our panel. amount of talent up here. Uh, please, uh, any questions um, specifically for anyone on the panel or for <coughs> the panel in general, um, please feel free. Uh, hands, who wants to be, uh, who wants to be first? We've got, uh, we've got that round of questions. As a utility in general or specifically related to the project? general, um, we see, again, fault current limits I'll speak to because it's really pertinent to the technology in, in, in the room. That is something that we're seeing low growth, did die down a little bit. Uh, most recently, 2008 was the, the downturn in the economy. And that was kind of a, a bit of a stay of execution for us because low growth will probably see continue as the economy rebounds. And um, as low growth continues, we have very finite space to work within, existing facilities, space is at a premium. We can't keep expanding our system. It's way too costly to be constructing in New York City. And what we are trying to do is figure out ways to reliably keep supplying power at these ever-growing levels. And one of the issues that we run into are, are fault currents. So in general, that's the big, the big problem. Um, but more specifically focused in on here, that's why we're so focused in on fault current limiting. That is one of the, the we spent, we have programs of tens of millions of dollars a year just upgrading breakers. So exceeding our 40 kiloamp capacity and all these breakers that we're putting, we're putting in 63 kAs where we can. Um, it's expensive, it's, it's, it's a programmatic thing for us. And if we could come up with an economic viable, viable con solution to help mitigate these fault current problems, that's really the driving impetus uh, for us. In terms of, of the project, um, really just kind of getting utility folks used to putting superconducting system in the grid, putting a refrigeration system in, in the grid. We keep telling them it's a refrigeration system. They keep seeing cryogenics. It sounds like something that we're not used to. Um, and then understanding uh, we are implementing an asset sharing.
concept here where we're going to share uh, the power from the transform that's traditionally dedicated to one substation and we'll be able to, via the two-person inductor, supply a second substation in, prox in near proximity to it. Um, even just coming up with the operating protocols and figuring out what we're going to do and how it's all going to integrate with the control systems and the protection systems. So it's, it's kind of just doing this for the first time at the local level. We know that there's been other superconductor cables put in the grid, but for us, we haven't experienced it, touched it, picked it, and, um, and that's really kind of the, the hurdle for us at the moment, so we're going through that. Great. And maybe just to follow up on that, uh, we're, we're talking about four currents, but what's driving uh, the four currents? And, you know, maybe with the economy uh, recovering, we're going to see some more load growth, so what, what, what are the biggest causes of uh, the four currents that, that uh, you say are affecting this? Two of the big issues, again, new construction and, and load growth in the local area pockets, and then also uh, distributed generation. More and more distributed generators are looking to connect to the system in a way to reliably stay online, both if there's a fault zone in the feeder that they're feeding back into, um, and, and they also supply more fault current to the grid <coughs> in those local areas that we're not capable of, of, of handling, and it could easily burn up our equipment and uh, you know create a just a serious reliability issue. So it, it's really a, a, our own equipment being exceeded by just sheer load growth of new construction, but also these new distributed generators are coming in to, we want to enable them. Uh, we think they're a good solution um, for helping us manage our um, load management as well, um, but it's, we can't do it because we're adding fault current to the grid. So that is, those are two of the big issues that we're seeing at the utility at the moment. Yes. Uh, Maybe just to amplify what John's saying, uh, if you look at the history of, uh, can everyone hear? of new loads has never been broken. There's always a new device that's going to make us able to do things better. Technology in the United States is the only way to compete with the rest of the world. Technology takes energy. And if you don't worry about that, you might want to worry about the plug in hybrid. If you take a 5 kilowatt house and attach a 15 kilowatt uh, PDD to it, and how many people are going to charge when there's not many chargers, God only knows, but you're going to put it on eBay. Bottom line is you have a problem at the local level, and you have a problem when the air goes up in a grid, and you have a problem when they concentrate in the city center as green vehicles. So it's it's going to accelerate, there's no question about it, and I love LED lights, but there's going to be a give back because I'm seeing LED lights on yield signs, and in places we never thought there'd be lights because they're cheap. on superconducting magnetic energy storage. Um, typically, there's not much energy in magnetic fields, but it's fast. Uh, where do you see it fitting in in the future? So um, a number of places, generally we've got very, very short duration storage needs. Um, if you look at the storage community, let's say five, seven years ago, um, and look at sort of the, the motives and discussions out there, and there's, there's some really good papers on this. Um, they said, you know, if we can just store wind energy that's generated at night or solar energy in the day and then spread it out over different times, uh, you know, everything's going to be fine. Um, that's fine if you're just trying to move energy from one time of day to another time of day. It's not okay to try and provide capacity to provide some hours back to the grid point. Um, it's not just about moving energy from one time to another time. The other big disruption that's happening technologically on the grid right now is especially places like CP are developing very, very fast natural gas treatment plants that can handle a cold start to an online natural gas treatment plant. That means you can envision you're spinning a service module with a cold asset, like an underground asset. That changes everything. So now what you need to do is have storage that provides power for very, very short duration and provide that capacity to give you the ride through it effectively so that also the, uh, uh, the other part that people think about is the solar panels. If you want to just one little puff of cloud and move it across the, uh, the sky, and that averages out over time, um, that's one meteorological condition. If you wind up having conditions, say in, in Arizona, they'll have um, um, a condition where it's uh, 
talking about a lot of energy there. Exactly. exactly. So this is, this is the whole idea is you wind up having a very distributed location. It's got very, very high value add each application. Um, so there's a military distribution system and a micro distribution sort of application where it's not you know, supporting a, a, um, a residence here, but it's supporting a critical piece of the sensor that might have, but also might have some very, very high intermittent load Start talking about power applications and the amount of circuit conductors and the amount of 
refrigeration is a process that that the individual is actually doing through by several orders of magnitude. I cannot even think of how many orders of magnitude it will increase. So will will this this development in of power will then actually drive cryogenic technology? Will it drive different industries technology? What is the what is the technology area that we as a climate scientist need to get driven faster <coughs> in order to achieve what we all want to achieve with the power industry? I don't know who will answer this question. <laughs> well, general question. I think it's probably the other way around. The MRI industry is driving cryogenic. Driving that part is, is continuous kind of uh, improvement or breakthroughs in uh, wire performance. That's what we are working on. That's what the power is. I was just going to say similarly, uh, we're, we're developing a fault chronometer. Right now, though, the pieces exist, right? There's tape that, that can make this fault chronometer work. The cryogenics exist. But the key is we're at revision one. You know, we're, this is the first deployment of it. We know once it's out there and it's working and it's deployed, we're always going to be pushed for reducing size of the system, reducing cost, reducing the amount of tape, you know, improving the tape performance, improving the cryogenic support. So we know that, you know, again, that the pieces exist to make this product right now, but there's going to be evolution of the, you know, the device, you know, our product as well as all the pieces that make it up. So I think it's, we can't just say one of them is really the, the Achilles heel or the, the low hanging fruit. There's going to be, I think, everything in the system needs to be refined and, and optimized, you know, as we go along. And that's going to be years, you know, it's going to be a lot of years of development and refinement of all the pieces that make up the system. I think you bring up a, a sort of broad, more broader uh, philosophical question. Actually, we did a, a study in DOE literally about three years ago. Um, we just did an annual update on it. It's actually an office of science and technology policy that gets involved in this as well. It's looking at all critical materials overall. The American Physical Society did a study on this uh, a few short years ago as well. Um, helium is the one critical material, but it's not one of these kind of big critical questions that we get from scientists. I'm reminded I, I did uh, um, um, low temperature semiconductor work a few years ago and did uh, a series of work in Eastern Europe. We had very little um, helium in it, but if you're trying to do low temperature physics work, you have to have plenty of room for helium. Every laboratory had a, had a hood over it so that um, in my lab in, in, in North Carolina, we would you know, have to order the uh, liquid to the temperature of the earth and then we would order it to the portion of the earth where we want to use that helium. Um, and it was just a, a pricing issue. In that case, they would 
just to make a, a follow-up comment on that, I mean, it, it could uh, directly cool uh, by conduction cooling at intermediate temperatures, but there you need <coughs> the right development of, of reliable uh, uh, cryocooler technology. And then, of course, as you mentioned, is, uh, is just uh, having closed systems with the recondensing systems and so on. So you have to I mean, you go, go over to the semiconductor store, you probably have to have a file on all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, 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 a well-known commercial. But the trick is not to let it evaporate into the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, Steve Eckberg with Atrium. I'd like to ask you about Deployments one in AI, I think it's important in helping fund deployment and making it because it's, it's not going to, we're not going to put it in a place that's going to affect reliability until we can trust it. And therefore, it's not really earning for us as a, as a utility asset. So we really need some help in, in subsidizing that while we get familiar with that. But also, in, in terms of the cable itself, right now, I think there needs to be some focus on getting the price point down to, um, right now there are substitute goods that are reliable and they're cheaper. So there's really no impetus for us to be looking at cables, at cables themselves, to sub as, as a substitute good for what we already have. Um, perhaps maybe to focus on new areas um, where we don't have answers, like fault current limiting, like energy storage, are going to be good jump starters. Places where we need solutions are good places to focus. And if they can bring down the economies of scale and bring down those uh, cost, those barriers of cost of entry, maybe then you'll start seeing them deployed as a substitute good. to add one, one piece. I think you're right. I think deployment is certainly a big, big, you know, that's what we've been running into is deployment, knowing that the device has to be out there at least four seasons. You know, that's we've kind of echoed is it has to be out there for a year. But 
but if we're talking like five to ten years before it really starts adopting, I think that's where some companies are going to have struggle saying, I'm going to invest for ten years before I start seeing any ROI on this. And that's where I think that was that was what we said when we got purchased by Applied Materials. It was trying to convince them that you know you're not going to start seeing revenue from this this product for a few years. It really has to be you know people understanding that it's out there, it's operating. Um, they're not going to start major scale. They're not going to see one deployment and then say we're going to start putting this in our toolbox. All new substations are going to have this. It's, it's really about education about what this device is, what it can do, and then helping with deployment. And that's that's really where we kind of swallow that pill, saying this is how it's going to be. Let's just deal with it and, and, and adjust to that. Um, and then education too. You know, you know, Zach mentioned earlier about the fear of you know cryogenics, and, and we've coined the phrase you know cryophobia. Because you know we've actually gone to the point where we've taken all our presentations early on and removed cryogenics and replaced it with refrigeration, because it really is a relatively simple system. But once you know some utility engineers they see the word cryogenics, it, you know, it kind of sets them back a little bit. So it's really education and support support on deployment. I, I, I will I will start with this. Is the uh, That's really a role where we can play in this, both in the applied research side, which is what Doug Lee looks at, and then look at the manufacturing side as well, which is where there's an increasing recognition of the federal role of investment in this, which is saying, where's their pre-competitive problem in this thing? That's a common problem for everyone working in the industry, it's not a case of just like cryo refrigeration and, and more, more efficient, getting reliability of refrigeration, getting long life cycles.
this is within the continental United States. So why not use some of those facilities to test that? So let's say you wind up getting some of these things to test that. Most of them, they, they have test bedding on them. There, there is a need for higher power reliability, especially in a network worldwide for requirements for this kind of technology. That power reliability is a big risk for the installation. So why not demonstrate some of these within those capabilities? Start getting a couple years of life back there. So now you can say, hey, Con Ed, this worked really well at Fort Bragg. This worked really well, well at Fort Bragg. This worked really well at Nellis Air Force Base. We've got 20 years of data, two years of data, five years of data, whatever it takes. Now we've got a way to take that on. So there are parts of the government that's not the same program that's always been there. But there are other parts of the government where there are a need for these kinds of superconductivity, making that awareness. And there are a number of people in this room who are working in that area. And uh, again, we, we, we certainly want to encourage that. Sorry. Yeah, just a quick comment. The, the customer really needs and uh, there's one, one very nice example in 1982 and 1983 with the first MRI systems were born. They actually didn't have any cooling systems. There was no cooling. They had nitrogen vessels, a heating boiler. Heating boiler was one liter per hour. If you do it well, you can do the correction. So really show the customer this is the difference in the image between a resistive system and a system that is different.
that's what has driven us to four cart limiter. And if we were working on a four cart limiter search, we would have gotten one by now and we would have demonstrated by then it shouldn't have happened. So, you know, well, sometimes we have to look at the development plan and see if we're going after the thing that's going to be the first benefit to the greater idea. Regulation like what China is, if that's in, in fact what they do is, is mandated that a certain technology be used and, you know, and sell power to a certain percentage, it, it kind of probably artificially props up an industry for a little while and maybe doesn't challenge them to get to the meet the need at the, the, the price point that's really necessary for the product to be viable. I, I'm not sure that that's the solution here. Uh, if there was a, a smart regulation, something that maybe did say, you know, it's increasing energy efficiency, you know, and these line load losses, let's get rid of those, and perhaps there's a benefit there to be realized through this regulation that also happens to uh, push a technology over the edge. I think that might be something that's worthwhile, but just a regulation to, to mandate and say, uh, you know, you see these things with some of the wind providers in Europe, um, there, there was mandates to put these in, um, and the, the markets aren't responding well to those, um, with some of the tariffs put in place. I, I'm not sure that's necessarily Maybe it's partially a solution if it's smartly drawn up, though, and I think it, it is something where the regulators could, you know, if, if there was a conversation between regulation, OEM, and end users, perhaps, to kind of figure out something that would be a worthwhile incentive to push it over the edge, it might be something useful, but it would need to be coordinated among those two groups. Okay. Uh, we're bumping up against the uh, break right now. Maybe one more question. I think it's more of a comment. I think the field is completely resource limited. Uh, you're looking for long-term demonstrations and support from the government. We're sitting here in a beautiful place, the nanoscale center, where we just hold $15 billion of investment has gone in. I have not seen anywhere around the world a superconductivity science center of equivalent or long-term funding, stable funding, where you get together all the best minds and resources to work out you know, this myriad number of fundamental issues that are bridging this gap because superconductivity has been around 112 years now. We know how it works. We know how to make good applications from it. We don't know how to make it cheaply. That's one of the cost limiting things. And there's the access to the market for it. But you got a center like this, and I'm sure there's other states and other places that have large uh, dedicated science centers like this that have billions of support that come a lot from the local and federal government, but also from industry and these partnerships. And that's where you can put in the resources to get through these, because when you deal a piecemeal, one, one company, even a big company like GE, there's only so much they're going to do before their shareholders say, I need the, you know, the ROI now, what do I get have? So you need that long-term stable funding. And as we heard before, you know, the superconductivity program was about $40 million a year over over 15 years sounds like a lot. It's really peanuts compared to what we do in other types of, of areas. And it could have the impact, uh, you know, on, on economics, on, uh, on energy that are just, you know, as widespread as nanoscience will be. And I think, you know, superconductivity has already demonstrated that it has many uh, advantageous applications. There's just a lot more trying to get let out, and it just needs the support. Uh, on, a, on a wide scale. If I can make a comment on that also, then, then um, uh, you look at where sort of existing funding is coming over now, certainly by the way the science is going to fail. Are you going to be able to support on this with a stable base of R&D? So you're really talking about a manufacturing plant, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm not thinking. And 
one of the areas, growing areas of interest, uh, both in the DOE and DOD and the Commerce Department in Texas, is to say, how do we wind up supporting these pre competitive uh, deals um, so that it doesn't end up um, President uh, budget request comes up before Congress for next year? There's a number of these national uh, MMIs, national, uh, na national manufacturing schemes, and these are envisioned as being sort of a five year. And then we're going to. will be around for a little while. Um, feel free to you know, come up, talk to them, grab them during the, uh, during the rest of the meeting. But I think they did an excellent job. Round of applause for the for the <laughs> so we're, uh, we're taking a break right now. And